This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. All right, um, we're to remedies for breach, uh, and we need to consider the remedies that are available for common law or under common law, and the remedies that are available under equity. Uh, and I must stress, first of all, that the equitable remedies are discretionary. These are at the discretion of the court. They're not uh, a right that can be claimed as of right. You can't go to court and say, I would like uh, an order of specific performance. You can only go and say to the, the judge, the court, um, I'm in a contract, this person has broken the contract, and... Um, an award of damages is no good to me. I, money is not the problem. The problem is I, I specifically want that object that we had agreed to, that I had agreed to buy. They had agreed to sell at that price. And the court will say, well, you're right, you know, damages is not really a sufficient remedy. Um, I think the only thing we can do is give you an award of specific performance, and, and that will involve the breaching party from carrying out their obligations under the contract. So equitable remedies are discretionary at the discretion of the court. You, you can't go into court and say, I want an injunction. All you can do is say, this person has broken a contract, can you help me? Now I've got a number of remedies which are listed out for us here. Uh, and there is this distinction between common law and, and equity. Um, and there's a general maxim here, general principle that says that where damages is a sufficient remedy, then damages will be awarded. If, if monetary compensation is sufficient to compensate the injured party, then that's what will be awarded, monetary compensation. So we have then damages, which is the big common law remedy. This is the big one. And the courts will always look instantly. Um, yes, we agree with you that there has been a breach in contract. Uh, now then, let's see what you can do about it. This damage is going to be sufficient. Yes, it is. And so damages will be awarded. Now, there are other elements of common law, but damages is the big one. The action for price, where you've been in a contract, you've performed your, your job. I was in this recently, that I'd done some lecturing for one of the big four firms, and uh, they were then arguing about the amount that was due to be paid. I had to, to go to court. I had to take this big four firm to court, and eventually won the case that they, they really didn't have a defence. It cost me a lot of money to win the case, but I did come out rather better than not being paid at all. So an action for price where a service has been rendered and, and now the, the person that received that service is now refusing to pay. So you take an action to recover the money that is due to you. And that's a common law remedy. It's a bit like damages, I suppose, in that it's a monetary award. It's not compensation. It's what I was due. It's not compensatory, but it's what I was due. And it's a common law remedy. Quantum Meroit, this is a, a little bit of, of Latin that um, it actually says in Latin what it would say in English, doesn't it? Does it not tell you in English that quantum is how much and Meroit is its worth, its merit? So it's how much is it worth? It? How much does it merit to be paid? And you're in the situation where part performance um, has been performed, but for one reason or another, the uh, service provider is either being forbidden from um, performing the remainder or is being uh, unable to perform the remainder because of extraneous events. And we've got cases like Hernig and Isaacs where a builder was, um, he'd substantially performed. There's little bits and pieces that hadn't been done. That's the same as uh, another one, uh, Bolton and Mahadeva, um, where 
substantial performance had been rendered, but then the re service receiver was not happy with the performance, and when this is in the, the case Bolton and Mahadeva, um, and said, I'm not paying you anything, and, and went and got alternative quotations to make right, to, to correctify, therefore, the mistakes of the original kitchen fitter. Um, and the court said, well, yeah, okay, but you can't refuse to pay everything out of a 6,000 kitchen. There are only three bits that were wrong, and so you have to pay substantially what it's worth. And what the court directed was that a valuation be obtained for the three bits that needed rectifying. That valuation was then deducted from the original contract price, and the remainder, therefore the balance, was payable to the kitchen fitter. Herning and, Herning and Isaacs, the builder had done substantially everything, um, but then couldn't carry on because he was going bankrupt. He, he declared himself bankrupt and could not finish the job. And so um, the court said, well, yeah, you can't have it just because you've done substantial performance. It's you that has breached. It's you that's that's um, the breaching part. You can't claim where you are the you are the one that has breached. Uh, what he could claim then was the value of the materials, the raw materials, the pile of bricks, the sand, the cement, and so on, that was still left on site and which had not been used up, and which therefore the the house owner, the householder was therefore able themselves to use, or the new builder coming in would use that stuff up. That had to be paid for. But all the work of digging foundations and building the walls and, and doing the inside plumbing and the electrical work and plastering, all of that, no, that wasn't paid because our builder was the one that breached. If it had been the other party that's breaching, then the builder would have been able to claim quantum merit. But it wasn't, it was the builder that breached. So those are, are common law remedies. Now I've already mentioned equitable remedies in an earlier lecture, but very, very quickly we, we have here, we've got um, specific performance, which I've already told you is where the court says, do it, just do it. Uh, and alternatively, the opposite of that is injunction, where the court says, stop it. The easiest way, I think, of remembering an injunction is where uh, a neighbour is building a wall so close to your uh, home, your windows, that is depriving you of your right of light, and then you can go to court and say, he's depriving me of my right of light, what can I do, can you help me? And the court will say, damages is not really a sufficient remedy, is it? Because damages is... You don't want money, you want light coming in your windows. And so we'll give an injunction and we'll, we'll award an injunction against the builder and say to the builder, stop it. And not just stop it, but take down that wall as well. Rescission, gone through this in, twice in previous lectures, rescission is the superman. It's, it's putting the people back into their pre-contractual position, restoring them to their... their, their positions, their pre-contract positions, um, for instance, because a person has been, been suffered under a misrepresentation and has been induced, for example, into a partnership, uh, and now he discovers that, in fact, all these stories that he was told before the uh, partnership agreement was entered into, they were all false and they were all misrepresenting the situation. So he can go to court and say, can you help me? I've suffered a misrepresentation. What can I do? And the court will say, well, damages is not really a sufficient remedy. The best we can do for you here is to rescind the contract, put you back, turn time backwards and put you back into that pre-contractual position. So that's rescission. Rectification, where... A genuine mistake has been made, and neither party spotted it when the mistake was made. It was only afterwards. Uh, there's a case called Henkel and Pape. Let me get a pen. Henkel and Pape. And I did say earlier on 
that I would say at the start of each lecture, you don't need to remember these case names. No, you don't. Don't even think about trying. Henkel and Pape was about some guns, some rifles, and there were a hundred rifles involved with uh, the, the seller is trying to sell a hundred rifles, and the buyer says, yeah, okay, and negotiations have gone on, and we talked about them, we discussed it, he said, I don't want a hundred rifles, what am I going to do with a hundred rifles? I want three. So three was uh, agreed upon, and then when he wrote it out, instead of putting three, he wrote the. So he ordered the rifles, and, and the seller was thinking to himself, I've sold 100 rifles, fantastic, because that was what we were talking about. Anyway, it went to court when 100 rifles were delivered. He said, I don't want 100, I don't want it. I'm not paying you for 100, I only want three. Well, you wrote 100. Well, both parties knew that he didn't mean 100, that they had agreed on three, and it was a mistake, therefore, to say I want the rifles instead of I want three rifles. So rectification, the court will help, where it's a genuine mistake and, and both parties were mistaken in, in what they thought was happening. A Mariva injunction. A Mariva injunction is in a situation where a company or a person is about to go into liquidation or bank, declare themselves bankrupt, and there is a suspicion that this bankrupt person or liquidating company is likely, when it's made known that there is an action to be taken in court against them, it's thought by the plaintiff that steps will be taken by the company, liquidating company or the bankrupt person, to put their assets out of reach of a liquidator, out of reach of a trustee in bankruptcy, to transfer them, often at an undervalue, into their own personal names, to transfer them to preferential creditors. A Mariva injunction is where somebody goes to court, asks for a liquidation order, but doesn't tell the other person. So is asking the court for a piece of paper that puts the company into liquidation, but the company doesn't know it's in court because if they did, then they would immediately get rid of these assets. So the plaintiff goes along and says, I want a liquidation order. And while you're thinking about it, could I have a Mariva injunction freezing the company's assets so the company is no longer able to deal with their assets and buying and selling and, and carrying on trade? While you're making your mind up about whether or not to grant me a liquidation order and put the company into liquidation. Can I have this Mariva injunction in order to prevent these assets being put out of reach of a subsequently appointed liquidator? Liquidated damages, that's an interesting expression, isn't it? Liquidated damages is where the two contracting parties before or at the time of drawing up the contract the two contracting parties make a genuine attempt to pre-estimate the potential loss in the event that either party breaches the contract. So those are liquidated damages. They're a genuine, it has to be a genuine attempt at a, a reasonable estimate of the damage that will be suffered in the event that one well, or either party breaches. But if the court views this as a penalty or in the nature of a penalty, then the court won't uphold this liquidated damages. And this liquidated damage clause will be built in to the contract itself. In, in the event that you breach it, this will be payable. In the event that I breach it, this will be payable. But if there's any element of penalty involved, the court says, no, we're not having that. It's up to us to award penalties. It's not up to you to agree penalties. And this is the case of Dunlop and New Garage, where it was a genuine attempt into photo and stiletto. It was not a genuine attempt. Ford and Armstrong, not a genuine attempt. And so the court ignored them. If a penalty, the court will not allow it. Okay, remedies, sundry points. Equitable remedies, I've already mentioned this. Equitable remedies are discretionary, at the discretion of the court. You can't go and claim the mouse of right. One or two 
one line is basically about equity. Equity will never act in personam against the, um, the, the, the breacher. So if I breach a contract with you, um, the court will not make me go ahead and perform. If I enter into a contract to perform, for instance, at, at one of the other big four firms, I used to do um, work for their training courses. And um, if I had turned around at the last minute and said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to turn up this time, sorry about that. Well, I'm clearly breaching a contract for personal services. Well, it's no good them suing me and hoping that the court will grant a discretionary remedy a specific performs. Mike, you will go. You will travel to Estonia and, and give a lecture on a training course. You will do it. Well, no, the court won't do that because the court is not able to exercise any sort of control over the quality of the performance that I render. So if you, if you said to David Beckham, you will turn out and play for Manchester United. Well, if he puts a kit on and stands in the centre circle and just stands there and watches the ball go backwards and forwards and he doesn't move, then he has turned out in the kit for Manchester United. You can't control the quality of the performance that he renders. And even if he runs around, he might be running around somewhere near a corner flag, nowhere near. The, uh, the, the, the action where the ball is. So because the court is not able to control the quality of a person's personal performance, equity will never act in person against the, the, the breacher. Delay defeats equity. It's known as the doctrine of love. If you feel that you have a claim, then really you should take that claim on a pretty prompt basis. You, should, you shouldn't hang around and delay and delay. And because if you delay, then you're defeating the concept of equity. Equity doesn't like delay. If the court's going to give you a discretionary remedy, then you should not yourself have delayed and been dil dilatory in asking for this remedy at the court. It will not, equitable remedies will not be awarded if the contract has been affirmed. If you have invested in a new company's shares on the strength of um, uh, a prospectus prepared by a promoter, and this has been issued generally, and you've applied for and been given shares, and then you subsequently discover that there is a severe misrepresentation within that prospectus, a clear false statement of some known or discernible fact within that prospectus. And, and you have relied upon that and invested. If you were to receive and bank a dividend from that company, you do so on the basis that you're saying, I am a member of the company, I am entitled to the dividend, I have banked the dividend. If you bank that dividend or don't send it back to the company, if you bank it, then you are affirming or confirming your entitlement to that dividend and therefore you are affirming the contract of you buying those shares. All right, let's have it not as a dividend. You discover this misrepresentation shortly before the annual journal meeting and notice is sent round to all the members on the register of members about the annual journal meeting. And so you turn up at this annual journal meeting and you don't say anything you don't join in any discussion like you might want to do if you wanted to confirm that you were a member. So you don't say anything. And then right at the end, the chair says, is there any other business? And you say, yeah, I have a question. It said within that perspective, blah, 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 blah. On the strength of that, which is false, I have applied for and been granted shares. 
I want to give up my shares and I want my money back. You should never have opened your mouth at that meeting. You should never even have attended that meeting because by your attendance you are confirming, affirming that you are entitled to attend and you are only entitled to attend as a member or as a proxy holder. That if you if you attend as a proxy holder, we'll talk about proxy holders when we look at meetings and resolutions. But if a member has appointed you as a proxy, fine. You're attending not in your own right, but you're attending as a proxy. That would be okay. But if you're attending in your own right, and you say, Chair, I have this question. I have suffered as a result of a misrepresentation. I want my money back. You should never have opened your mouth because you have just affirmed the contract and destroyed your chances of, of rescission. Rescission will not be awarded if it's not possible to restore the parties to their original pre-contractual position. If you are induced to enter into a partnership as a result of some misrepresentation and you enter into a partnership and then subsequently the partnership goes limited and then you discover that you suffered a misrepresentation. The rights of people suffering from a liquidated company are rather different from the rights of people that suffer as a result of a bankrupt partnership. So we can't put you back into your original pre-contractual position because the nature of the organisation that you are now a member of is rather different than the nature of the organization that you agreed to join as a result of this misrepresentation. So if you can't be put back into your original pre-contractual position, you have lost your right of rescission. Equitable remedies will not be awarded the injured party has not acted fairly. They, the maxim says that he who comes to equity comes with clean hands. Or, he who, he who seeks equity does equity. And they're both one-liners with reference to equity. And it means that if you're looking for the court to award you a fair remedy, then you yourself must have acted scrupulously fairly. And if you haven't, if you've got dirty hands, if you, if you yourself have not been totally honest and above board and absolutely fair and given every opportunity for the, for the breacher to, to mend their ways. If you have not yourself been scrupulously fair, then don't expect an equitable remedy to be awarded in your favour. They won't be awarded if some innocent third party would be adversely affected. Yeah, it's, it's almost the same as um, not possible to restore parties to the original. If some innocent third party is going to suffer as a result of, of a rescission, the court won't give you rescission. The Limitation Act plays a part. I know we already said that delay defeats equities, but if you delay five years and 11 months and then take action, well, that is within the period of the Limitation Act. The Limitation Act says action shall be brought or commenced within six years of the cause for action arising. In the context of a specialty contract, that six years extends to 12. I'll remind you in a moment what a specialty contract is. So take your action within six years of the course for action arising. Unless the course of an action arising is not apparent until after six years has expired. And there's a case, a wonderful case, Lynn and Bamba about the purchase of some plum trees. The plum trees are, are the, the variety called purple pershaw plum trees. And the purple pershaw plum tree doesn't bear fruit until its seventh year. So you go along to the garden centre and say, do you have any purple pershaw plum tree for sale? And the garden says, yes, and the beautiful purple pershaw plum trees. And you plant them. And then in the seventh year, they turn out to be Victoria plums or some other Type, but certainly not a purple pershaw. So you go back to the garden centre and say, I bought some purple pershaw plum trees here six, seven years ago. 
and they're not perfect Pershaws, what are you going to do? <coughs> and the garden centre says nothing, because the limitation exists six years. Well, the cause for action does not arise within that first six year period in the context of a purple push or plundry. And so within a reasonable time, six years from the date <coughs> that the breach could reasonably have been discovered. <coughs> Excuse me. Just finally, uh, specialty contracts. I don't know if you do remember or not from your contract law lectures, a simple contract or a parole contract um, requires consideration to move from one party and the other party. So we have two-way consideration. A specialty contract does not need that. Um, it may have, but it doesn't need it for it to be enforceable. So if I were to promise to pay you money um, and you don't give me anything in exchange, you don't give me any performance, you don't give me anything of any value, I just promise to pay you some money. <clears throat> but it's not signed by me, it's not written, it's not signed, sealed and delivered uh, and witnessed. Um, then it's as a specialty contract, if it is signed, sealed and delivered in the presence of witnesses and, and signed as witness, that would be a specialty contract and it only needs one way consideration. Now, in that situation, Limitation Act, it says 12 years. But normally we're looking at parole, simple contracts, six years. Unless we have this linen bamber situation where the cause for action could not have been discovered within that six year period. Okay, so that's uh, remedies for breach within common law and within equity law.